This is Jonathan Cain, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. All right. Hey, um, I spelled your name wrong back in the marquee. I'm going to fix that in a second here. <laughs> it's <laughs> good, Jonathan man. Crane. Hey, again, when you have a lot of hats on your head, sometimes the hat gets in front of your eye and you, you miss something. I'm going to fix that momentarily. But uh, Jonathan, thanks for coming on the show, man. I, I uh, It's always great. The network is strong. And when you reach out and you say, hey, I'm looking for people to book, I love, be, I love being able to promote different messages that um, – you know, that need promoting, you know, causes and whatnot. Tell us a little bit about Living Teal and what you guys are trying to do, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So Living Teal is the lifestyle umbrella underneath FAIR, which is Food Allergy Research and Education, which is the world's largest uh, NGO in the food allergy space. And FAIR's mission is to uh, improve the life and health of Americans living with food allergies and providing hope. And, you know, we're the voice of the patient, right? And Living Teal, again, is the lifestyle arm. If you think about food allergy, which impacts 85 million Americans, so one in four just about, um, food is it's so central to everything we do. Most people eat three times a day. Uh, we eat at school. We eat at holidays. Um, so it becomes kind of a lifestyle thing. So for all of the uh, research that we do, education, advocacy things, people just live with it. And again, it's 85 million Americans. So what we wanted to do was give them an outlet through Living Teal uh, with recipes and holiday tips and, you know, how to manage this without it being a defining thing. Yeah, boy, the holidays, perfect time to have this show because how many people had to have the gluten-free stuffing or all these different things that, you know, and as we get better at medicine, we find out there's more of these things and they exacerbate one another. It's, it's what a great mission to do that. Why did this even need to be done in the first place? If so many people have food allergies, there's got to be so much information out there. What what hole do you guys fill? You know, it's so interesting you should say that. So I, I joined uh, FAIR last uh, this past June, and I was aware of food allergies. I mean, it's hard to live in society without being aware of it. But the numbers are staggering. Again, 85 million impacted, 32 that live with life-threatening food allergies. So again, they have a peanut or some milk or some soy. They can go to the ER and someone goes to the ER every three minutes with an anaphylactic reaction. Um, my guess is that it's not front of mind for most people because most people with food allergies learn to live with it. They don't want to be a burden. I'm sure in their immediate circles or bubbles, their, their family and friends know about it and you just sort of live with it. It's kind of like a uh, terrible analogy, but seatbelts, you know, when it mm -hmm. was the thing, like no one talks about seatbelts, but they save lives. And that's sort of what fair is here to do is to remind people like, we need to treat this seriously because without us, without the education, um, it's easy to fall back into habit of, you know, well, one bite won't hurt you when one bite could very much hurt you. Yeah, or even for some allergies, like nut allergies in particular, the wrong kind of oil, the, I mean, just opening a bag of peanuts on an airplane can be life threatening for some people. Ab absolutely. And, and it is, or going to a baseball stadium, which hopefully we can all do again this coming spring. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things that I think because it's so ubiquitous that no one's talking about it. And the reason that I'm here specifically, my living teals here is to shine a light. You know, we want to make this thing that is, everywhere famous um, so the people talk about it respect it um, there's obviously a bullying crisis with kids um, but this is not a kid disease you know uh, food allergy impacts young old uh, black white male female gay straight it doesn't know uh, a demographic um, adult onset food allergies are real as well and they don't really get talked about at all and those mm. are crazy scary um, the stories that i've heard since joining you know, people be out having shrimp for the third time in a month and then two hours later they're in an er because the reaction could be two hours onset couldn't happen yeah. in minutes but it can happen hours later so you know we're we're trying to uh we don't want to make it scary it shouldn't be scary we want to you know leave the fear at home but keep the responsibility and how again how we can celebrate and it's little things like um you I mean we talk about the holidays thanksgiving just happened yesterday christmas is coming up potlucks are a big thing, right? People come to their friend's house or families and they bring their stuffing or whatever. And we had to like, all right, let's, let's educate mom, dad, grandma, whoever it is, like just one bite won't help what cross contact is. Um, again, how to self advocate, things like that. To be honest, you know, and we all learn these things. I think this is what Gen X delivers to all of us is we start off with the position and then we go, you know what? Like, 
back when I was a kid being gay, you could say, you know, faggot. You could say all kinds of words to people. I mean, the N word wasn't the N word. It was actually, you know, a derogatory thing. People shouted at each other. And then the Gen X folks like me became along. We're like, Hey, we can do better than that. Um, you know, just like with people who have mental disabilities, you know, it's, not only have we embraced them and put them on TV as a community, we've also said you can have jobs. Like there's jobs that people with a variety of disabilities can do. That's all happened in these last like last 30 years. And so I say all that because I'm completely part of this transition of ick, I don't like that, I don't know it, to hey, whatever, man. I'm I'm awesome. You're awesome. We're all awesome together. So this food allergy thing at my core. Right. My initial animal response is, is I don't give a damn if you're allergic to peanuts or not, you know, or sesame oil or what. What's that got to do with me? I'm just going to party. And that rejection, the only way I know how to fix that is through like socializing these things and saying, hey, you know, this is really I carry an EpiPen in case somebody misses something because I can't miss. I mean, that's I don't have to carry an EpiPen anywhere, you know, so talk Absolutely. a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's funny, you know, you mentioned mental health, and I think that that whole no stigma movement, uh, early 2000s, was huge to recognize that, again, you know, and I don't know the statistics, the statistics with depression, but it's pretty, again, uh, ubiquitous. And with food allergies, there is a stigma that we need to eliminate from society, because you shouldn't be embarrassed to say out loud to your waiter or waitress, um, is this cooked in peanut oil? Is, you know, was this marinade on this barbecue made with soy or sesame? And obviously the owner of that restaurant is incentivized to make sure you don't get sick. You as the customer are incentivized. But again, that like, I don't want to raise trouble. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want them to spit in my food or whatever it is. We need to eliminate that completely. And I'll tell you a uh, terrible but real story, which is one of my very good friends has lived with a shellfish allergy. And I didn't know it. We've been out to eat a hundred times. And when I got this job, he's like, "Oh, that's you know interesting. I've got a, a shellfish allergy." I was like, "How did I not know?" He's like, "I don't want it to. I don't want to. I don't want people looking at me different." And you're like, "That's. I mean, I understand, obviously, but um, again, part of what we're doing here at Fair and Living Teal is to completely normalize it, uh, take the stigma out completely, and have people not just advocate for themselves, advocate for their family, their friends. You know, we don't want to live in a society without." milk, eggs, peanuts, tree nuts, et cetera. We just don't want to be so kind of uh, flipping about it. Like, you know, it's very serious for some people and we need to treat that with respect and not make them feel different or other than, um, you know, again, we've got to give voice to that patient uh, that doesn't want to feel like a patient. They just don't want to, they don't want to go into an anaphylactic reaction because you yeah. weren't being uh, serious enough with what they have. There's the, um, I like to turn the camera around and look at things from a different angle. And it, if you were to jump cut to 15 minutes later when they go into anaphylactic shock and you're having to race to find the person's purse to give them the EpiPen so they can inject themselves and they say, oh my God, was there, was there peanut oil in that in, when you fried the turkey? Like, yeah. Why didn't you tell me? I would have used any other kind of oil. Like, just tell me, you know, like you would say that. But you might not say that before. Realize, yeah, I'm cooking the turkey. Just say thanks. You know, <laughs> like yep. your attitude can change if you see someone in desperate, you know, physical crisis. It's uh, when you think about it in that way, and then also, you you think about like folks who come out to their parents and they're terrified to do it, and then the parent is like, I, I love you. I, I, first off, I already knew, you know, or whatever, and and. But that jump is so hard for the person doing it. Same thing with allergies. Like, I just don't want to be a bother. I was on this ridiculous eating program for a while. And uh, I'm like, uh, can I get an omelet? Can I only get one yolk in it? Because today is one yolk day. And the waitress is great about it. She's like, I don't feel bad about it. It's fine. We're all on some kind of eating program, you know. Mm -hmm. But these things that allow us the grace to be graceful, you know, I, I think are really important. In, in, uh, in how we approach things. Because, yeah, I mean, one in three, tens of millions, scores of millions of people yeah. that have these situations, I definitely, I don't account for it on a day-to-day -day basis because it doesn't really matter to me. That's your job. You've got a gluten intolerance. That's your job, not my job. But some of these things, they're a lot more. Oh, know, a thousand percent. Dangerous. No, luckily, um, you know, food allergies impact so many. And most people that have them, it's not 
life threatening, you know, oh my God stuff, but it is for enough. And we talk about the haves and the have nots at fair. And the haves are the people that have witnessed uh, or had their own anaphylactic reaction out in the wild. Mm -hmm. And they take this, as you would imagine, incredibly seriously. Again, it's like having, if you've never known someone with, you know, X, Y, or Z, it just becomes this thing in your, in your brain, or you've heard Jimmy Fallon make a joke about it or whatever. Jimmy Fallon made an allergy joke at the beginning of the summer. It was a whole thing. Um, it didn't bother me, but there are a lot of people that were very deeply offended by it. And I understand. Um, but again, once you've seen that anaphylactic reaction, suddenly it's very difficult to ever wipe it from your brain. You will only see like, I need to be, you know, uh, take this seriously. And again, the advocacy goes to both the patient, but also just the family. And I don't mean the immediate family, I mean like society. It, it doesn't take a ton of work for us to just sort of say like, hey, you know, do you have something or just to be vocal and like this was cooked in this kind of oil. That's why labeling is so important. Yeah, it's interesting. Again, I, I keep going back to what I don't know about all these things and how much I just don't regard it and how prevalent these things are. It's yeah, it's, it's bananas. Someone in our, our family circle has a severe uh, nut allergy and another person has just allergies in general. So they're allergic to like the list of things they're not allergic to is shorter than the, but I literally never account for it. You know, and and a lot of the moms in our group, they account for the nut thing because they've already doing it. So they've taken a lot of that load off of us. But, um, you know, tomorrow night, there's a Mike Tyson, uh, Roy Jones Jr. exhibition fight. I'm going to buy pizzas. I haven't for one second considered anybody's intolerances or uh, <laughs> and what a jerk, right? Like, I've not even considered this thing. And now I have to send a text out and say, does anybody have any food allergy I need to be aware of? And it's the simplest thing, but I don't want to do it, but I have to do it because I'm not a dick. Well, I mean, look, give yourself some slack. I, I think that um, I imagine the people that you're inviting over, you've eaten around them before. They probably haven't vocalized. But yeah, it's probably a good opportunity at this point to be like, did you know, did I miss something? You know, um, you know, I grew up in a in a in a Jewish community, and it was definitely like, is this family kosher? Because my family wasn't. And I literally shut down my school because I brought a ham and cheese sandwich in kindergarten. And they're like, you can't do that, buddy. Um, but, you know, we didn't know. And it wasn't, you know, until I had friends that were like, you can't do this or please don't. So, um, yeah, I would say it's good on you to have that thought to, like, send that text out. And hopefully moving forward, like the evites of the world, it'll be automatic check buttons, right? Like, you know, yeah. do you have food allergies? Make it easy. You know, again, ideally through the work that we're doing at FAIR and Living Teal, we're going to eliminate the stigma to a point where you don't even have to ask because they're going to go ahead and say, hey, you know, FYI, I have a weed allergy. Um, can you order me a gluten-free pizza? Right. Yes. And I, and I would. I would absolutely do that. I would even go as far as to order their own personal pizza so they would have it because, of course, you know, you want to be a good host. <laughs> I was just thinking my, my friend Ron is also Jewish, and, but, but he's the kind of Jewish where I'm like, hey, I'm making fillets. Come over. I'll give you one. And I don't even think about it again because, you know, that's the kind of guy I am. And uh, uh, he gets there and I'm like, oh, crap, I forgot to tell you, I cook these things wrapped in bacon. And he's like, I'll just take the bacon off. You know, <laughs> it's like his version of, of what worked for him was very doable. You know, and I'm like, are you sure? Like, I, I'd bake you something else. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's a funny thing. We've definitely found in our audience that a vast majority are, are cool. You know, they're like, I get it. You know, we're just trying to live our lives too. There are definitely some hyper vocal, like I can't just take the bacon off or whatever the thing is. Right. Um, and we got to cater to all of them, right? We got to cater to the hyper vigilant, you know, and the super loose. It's funny. My head of marketing, she has allergies, her kids have allergies. And she's like, I'm going to, I'm not going to be the, um, the most vocal, uh, Karen out there, right? I'm not going to be the person that's just making yeah. so much. I was like, I'll do my thing. But then again, I respect her. And I also respect the people in our world that are the noisemakers and we need them. A society needs a balance of both, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I'm glad that you're doing this work. Let's talk a little bit about your aspect of this work because your background is incredible. And uh, obviously they picked the right person for the job, but talk a little bit about your experience and then why this makes you you know, particularly qualified to create this awareness and this uh, normalcy of accepting the food allergy thing and driving people to fair. By the way, everybody, look on the page if you're on the live side 
and take a look at the bottom on the screen or down there. And also you can go to their YouTube page, which is F-A-A-N-P-A-L on YouTube, and you can get there. Um, talk a little bit about your background, if you would, Jonathan, because it's, sure. uh, it's impressive. Uh, well, I appreciate that. And uh, who knew, who f- ever would have guessed I would land, land at uh, foodology.org. Um, yeah. I spent 22 years making television. You know, I started my career in 1998 at MTV. Uh, still have my MTV News Cube in the background. I keep it in every Zoom shot. Um, yeah, I, I did documentaries and game shows and dating shows and shows that I didn't tell my own parents I was making because it was embarrassing because it was <laughs> bottom of the barrel stuff. Um, but then I moved through my career through Fremantle, who do American Idol, Got Talent, Family Feud, Price is Right, Let's Make a Deal. Um, sold a bunch of shows there. Um, was a showrunner at, at Discovery Networks, working on you know all sorts of things. Um, the BBC. I always forget about the BBC. And what what's interesting is storytelling is storytelling, and connecting uh, humans to humans is is an important part of media, right? And the training that I had in the field for years as a uh, going back to when I was a PA, all the way up to a showrunner and the development exec, was telling emotionally pulling stories. Even if it was a game show, you're still watching a human on a, on a ride, right? Um, as I, Actually, I, when I teach TV still, I tell my students, um, every story, scripted, unscripted, short form, long form, podcast, you're taking someone on a journey, there's going to be an obstacle for your character, you've got to have them relatable, they've got to make choices so that you can be vicariously along the ride as an audience member. Um, but that emotional connection, I think, is what I learned so specifically making TV shows. And so when FAIR co- came along, they're like, we need to reach 85 million Americans that have this, that are impacted by food allergies. Um, but we got to do it in a way that's not scientific. You know, you can't connect to people by talking facts. You can't connect to people with statistics and just say like, every three minutes or, you know, 85 million. So how do you get them to care? How do you get them to activate? Well, there's a couple of levers you can pull, right? You can pull the scary lever, which is not my tactic by any means. I'd much rather pull the, we're all humans, let's have a big hug together and embrace each other and celebrate life. Um, So that was my goal, was to put a face on on food allergies and not just your Steve Carell's and Bill Hader's and Kelly Clarkson's, all three of which have food allergies. Um, They're not gonna, you know, spend too much time connecting. But like, what about the real moms, the real kids? Um, I just shot an amazing... My Food Allergy Story, which is one of our series on Living Teal Channel, which you can go to at livingtealchannel.com. Um, and it was this amazing 11 year old girl out of Wisconsin who had her first anaphylactic reaction at nine months and has turned her life, her young life, into advocacy. Because uh, she literally had people throwing, she's very allergy, throwing cheese at her in school. And you think about that, this like sweet, cute little blonde girl getting cheese thrown at her. You're like, how do I? All right your face, you tell your story, I'm sure that there's another little girl out there or a mom or a dad or a grandma that's going to feel emotionally pulled and then activate on it. And what does that activation look like? Well, it could be you're going to donate $10 to this food allergy nonprofit because our money goes right into research to end suffering food allergies. Or maybe you're just going to be a little bit more sensitive when you're at a restaurant or when one of your kids' friends comes over and they can't have something and you knew that and you made sure they had popsicles that they can eat. Um, one of our, our good friends is Shannon Miller, the, the gymnast from the 90s, and she's one of our, our faces. She does not have food allergies, but her son's best friend does. And she was telling me, like, the first time he came over, the kids were all having, you know, a movie night and popcorn and popsicles, and she didn't think about it. The popsicles had dairy in them. So the next time she was, you know, for sure to have some non-dairy you know, dessert treats as well. And then the kid felt more welcome. It just it's a beautiful snowball effect that is frankly so easy to do once you crack the door open. These heartfelt stories, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in this and, and people on the show already probably know what I'm about to say, but um, I, I worked a lot in combat zones and if you measure effect, you'll lose. But if you can create an affect, if you can get that response to stimuli, yeah, you got a chance to tell your story and get people to pay attention to it. You, like I said, you could say we've we've put out, you know, like the standard government, like we have a pamphlet, like yeah, but no one's picking it up and reading it. You can have a million pamphlets, but if you get one person to identify with what happens on an airplane, you know, um, right before the pandemic really kicked off, and you could still kind of fly without a mask. Uh, someone and I, we, we flew together somewhere, and this person had maybe a light seizure and passed out. It was terrifying. And I felt utterly hopeless. Luckily, 
no harm, no foul. Everything worked out just fine. Didn't have anything have to happen, but man, I mean, just that experience alone, it's like, you just never know when something is going to happen, you know? Absolutely. That's, you know, again, part of our, our mission uh, A is to give voice to the patient, but just if we can educate people in a compelling way, um, you know, I can tell you from my time at Discovery specifically that, you know, getting information across was super important. And it could be, you know, how many CCs in this engine or whatever it was. Um, but if we could do it in an entertaining way, you didn't feel like school, you know, and Discovery was masterful. Uh, and they still are. I don't, I'm no longer there. They're still masterful at educating without it ever feeling like class. And mm -hmm. I think that's really, you know, key. Again, if I can just get you, you know, trigger those mirror neurons. Oh, you look like me. You sound like me. Oh, that's an interesting story. Suddenly it becomes real easy to convert you into someone that, again, just cares. We're not asking much from our audience other than to just, just care a little bit, pay attention a little bit. And uh, again, it's not, it's not rocket science. I mean, don't tell our scientists that because they think it's rocket science. Um, the ones that are doing the real Lord's work of trying to end food allergy. But for my side in the awareness side of things, like I can just get people to care a little bit and not mm. be afraid to speak out. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not, not, not so much. Again, it's, it's funny you bring up being in the combat zones. That's, that's real, real stuff right there. We're, we're talking about restaurants and supermarkets here. <laughs> yeah, but just as dangerous. I mean, you know, you go yeah. into anaphylactic shock, you're going to need some attention real fast, either self-help or first aid of some kind. You know, I mean, it's, it's no joke, you know. I believe that's funny. Oh, not funny at all. But um, I recently did a, a pilot at Fort Irwin, and I was shocked to learn how many civilians live on base in the middle of the Mojave Desert and how you know, they had, I think it was 2,000 pets on base. We were doing a show about the veterinarians. And I was thinking, like, I wonder – if they have access to, you know, hypo and not hypoallergic, but allergy friendly foods, um, do they have gluten free flours there? Because there must be people on base, maybe not the enlisted, but the spouses, the kids, and they, they're, statistically they're there. And I remember when I was shooting on base thinking, you know, well, there's the PX and there was, you know, a, a Popeye's chicken. But like, are there options for the food yeah. allergy family? And I don't know that there were. So it's a smaller mission of mine, but I do want, uh, to make sure that all of my military brothers and sisters are, are always safe with access to clean food. You know, there's a, a funny thing. The military is so diverse and so accommodating to that diversity, but, but it is a big bureaucracy, right? And so you, um, they're absolutely, and I don't have to know specifically, I just know how these things work. There's absolutely meals for a variety of, of, um, I don't know, addendums, I guess you would call them, right? I'm Jewish. I'm orthodox. I'm, 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 I'm all these things, including food allergies, you know, and you may have less options, but it's like, Hey, we're going to go to the field. You would go to your first sergeant and say, first sergeant, I have the following uh, allergies or you may, hopefully your NCO would do it, but it's really your responsibility. I need to make sure that there's a box of, of MREs for me to eat. And then the first sergeant's going to look at you like you're crazy, you know, and then ask you to prove it. <laughs> You know, some first sergeants would not being unfair to first sergeants, but if you take those steps, they'll absolutely accommodate you. If you're a civilian who's going out to do like a training with these people and they're feeding you, you absolutely can say to them, these are the things, but it's awfully helpful to have a note from a doctor. It's awfully helpful to have a site like fair, you know, or, or living teal, whichever site you go to, I guess they're connected, but the, you know, that, that is an organization that's programmed to go, oh, okay, yeah, we need to account for that. You're right. That's right. And it's likely to reject you at first to require you to jump through a hoop or two. Sure. And outside of that, I mean, if, if you work at a tech company and you say, you know, I have this very particular food allergy, nobody can have trail mix in here because I can't have peanuts anywhere within 100 feet of me, you know, that's going to take some doing, you know? Yeah, it's it's interesting to mention that um, I've got many friends all over Hollywood, and one of them, well, many actually, at Netflix, and in their lobby, there's a, a snack room, and it's yeah. awesome, honestly. <laughs> but again, I, the last time I was there was before I was working in the world of food allergies. It didn't dawn on me, but now I'm like, that is a vector, like that zone. Oh my god, has yeah. literally trail mix in a thing. It's got cereal in a thing, and again, they're pretty nice treats. But if you happen to be affected by food allergies, like imagine you're going in there for a pitch, and it's the big moment. And then yeah. a little bit of that peanut dust gets on you. I'm not suggesting that Netflix needs to, you know, stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lobby. But it's just something that until you start thinking about it, you're not thinking about it. And they, it's yeah. it's a real thing. 
Uh, so what is living teal? What does that mean? Why the color teal? Predates me. Teal is one of the official colors of food allergies. Okay. Um, I guess a lot of uh, various uh, disease That's groups. their ribbon of choice or whatever. Yeah, everyone's got a thing, exactly. Um, we share it with ovarian cancer, I've learned, um, which is fun. Um, yeah. and it's not fun at all for anybody in that case. But yeah, so teal is the color. And uh, you'll notice uh, Food Allergy Awareness Month and Food Allergy Awareness Week. In this case, it's this May 10th. Um, there'll be a lot of food products that'll turn teal. Um, it just It's a signifier to an audience that's aware. So when you start seeing teal specifically in like your Whole Foods or um, I guess more higher end markets, because that's that tends to be where that product group tends to go. Um, it's there's a good chance that it is allergy friendly. And you living teal, a, you're a showrunner. You can do anything in Hollywood. I mean, you've done so many things. You've connected to zillions of people. Mm -hmm. Why this? I mean, like, why is this important for you to do it? What called you to it? Um, honestly, I love the challenge of it. And the one genre of producing I've never done previous to this was food shows. And I've got good buddies at Food Network, and I've been trying to get things in there. And it's um, weirdly enough, food TV programming is such an insular world that was hard even for me to break into it. So when this came around, it's like, oh, you get to create a channel and make food content, which I desperately wanted to do. It was a challenge. Can I pull this off? And I'm very proud to say, if you go to livingtealchannel.com, uh, you'll see some videos with uh, Chef Leslie Durso, uh, Chef David Rose, uh, Ali Khan from Cooking Channel. And they're proper stand and stir cooking segments that I think are pretty awesome. So it was yeah. a challenge. It's a challenge, but, but it's an important challenge. Do you do other projects in addition to this thing? Are you like working on features or something else? You know, I always have a couple irons in the fire. Hope, hopefully my boss isn't directly what no. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been working on a, a both a documentary and a feature based on the same subject matter um, with the Coast Guard actually for the last five years. And uh, it's a pretty amazing story. Turn of the century, a guy named Mike Healy um, was a uh, basically a runaway slave the turn of the century, became a merchant marine and became a captain in the precursor of the Coast Guard. And yes. his story is epic. ridiculous. It's one of the best stories I've ever heard. So I got the life yeah. right to that. Um, and weirdly enough, when I was at Discovery, uh, a lot of my Alaska shows had people surviving on reindeer. And right. I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. And then I found out through Captain Mike Healy that those reindeer are not native to North America. They came over from Siberia because he brought them over to save the native population of Alaska, which is such a cool little piece of history that is basically forgotten. And one of the only times something like that works, normally it's like, and then I brought over kudzu. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Then we brought rabbits to Australia. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> we got the invasive cane toads as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, it's just, it's an interesting story. So yeah, that's, that's been going on, but you know, the world of making features is uh, the long winding road. Yeah, we have people that make movies, indie films a lot, you know, because I like to celebrate what they do. Cause it's just so impossible. And and when they're young, they're just like, yeah, we asked for some money. We put some shots together and we made a movie. And I'm like, you don't get how hard it is to do. <laughs> like, you did it because you're audacious. But, man, and good for them for doing it. You know, I'm celebrating what they're doing. But, yeah, any movie is a miracle just to get everybody to say, yeah, the timing. Oh, my God, it's so hard. I mean, considering any movie of any merit has 15 different production partners at some level, to get them to give up ownership or editorial control even a little bit, it's yeah, it's um, it's a it's a miracle that anything ever gets made. I will I will say that. But <laughs> I also love the idea of the audacity of youth. I sold my first show at 22 um, because yeah. I didn't know that you needed an agent and yada yada yada. I literally just walked into an office. I mean, it happened to be at Viacom, so I could walk into that office. I'm like, can we do this show? And they're like, yeah, we can do that show. It's amazing. I actually sold the first two shows I ever pitched, and then I didn't <laughs> sell another show for the next seven years. Um, <laughs> it turns out it's really difficult, and I just got really lucky twice. Yeah, um, yeah. But yes, it is uh, it's a long and winding road. One of these days, I'll get this. I'll get my movie and the documentary on the side of it made as well. Yeah, yeah. It, but I mean, what a neat thing to be able to do. And and in this time of, I don't even know if multimedia is even the right term anymore, because yes, like in terms of etymology, it's the right term, but 
it's just multimedia, the way it's been used, it's completely smashed. You know, you can make a YouTube channel. You can push that stuff out onto Vimeo or any, I mean, you can get your stuff put on Amazon and truly like take the multimedia and then do multimedia nodes off of that and then create all of these points of brilliance where someone can find you and then get, get to what they need to get to. And I think about like that mom, you know, who finds out that their, their infant has food allergies and they're like, Oh my God, I have never thought about this. What am I getting? You know, and it's overwhelming. All it is is something you have to manage. And as a mom, they'll figure it out because it's manageable. But what were, what you're able to do with this, I just think it's remarkable. Well, that's, it's interesting you should say that because um, I have a 20 year old daughter and what I learned from her directly was the search bar for millennials and Gen Z's is YouTube. It's not Google. Right. And if you Google, well, now actually, if you Google food allergies or living teal, we pop up. But prior to me showing up, I'm happy to pat myself on the back. We didn't. It's like people want to see again those mirror neurons. How do I deal with this? Tell me a story. Show me how to cook. You know, right. I, I'm never going to make muffins again. No, no, you can make muffins again. Here's how. You know, you don't need the top nine. It, it's more difficult for sure without any of the top nine allergens. But, um, yeah, that was, again, part of the challenge and beauty was I wanted people to, uh, you know, in this amazing landscape that is cluttered with media, make some content that breaks through, that's sticky enough, magnetic enough, noisy enough, but still educational, um, yeah. that you'll actually hook an audience, they'll watch, they'll watch more episodes, and again, ideally, learn a little something along the way. Yeah, I mean, that's that. <laughs> ideally, that would be great. The... Uh, I'm going to put the link in again here and just update it because I got a link, but I want to make sure this is the best possible link for everybody who's trying to go to this thing. Um, the, you can always send people just to foodallergy.org. Um, all yeah. the, I mean, it's, it's our hub. Yeah, for sure. Foodallergy.org. And then also here's the YouTube channel again. Uh, so get more at YouTube. Yeah. Um, the idea of recipes is great. You know, being able to say, here's how we do dolma when you have a grape leaf allergy or whatever it is, you know, these, cause there's, we cook in a, a certain A to B pattern. We usually have 20 dishes that we go make and there are go to. And when you, when you try something new, like Acapulco delight that my, my cousin makes, you know, I make that once every other year or something like that. But to be able to bring in these other ideas, it's so easy, you know, just like all this uh, new cooking we had to do because of COVID, you know, like, Mm -hmm. I didn't even think about using grape leaf or all these ideas. I had kangaroo once. It tasted fantastic. If I had never had a steak before that, if it had been the first mover in my mouth in terms of, of meat products, I absolutely love it. It was a little weird because I'd already had cow, but not a thing wrong with eating kangaroo, you know? And so there's all these different ways to make things. Like I love uh, spaghetti squash. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you don't have to give me a noodle. If I can't have noodles, I would be totally fine. I love it. I think it tastes great. But I never knew to do that until like I saw a cooking show and they're like, here's a healthier option. And I'm like, I love vegetables. I love spaghetti squash. I'm in. Yep. Well, that's, I mean, I, again, as, as a foodie myself and, you know, let's be real, my, I consume so much food media. Um, it is, again, that's been my, it's my, my jam. That's why I wanted to produce it. Um, I love the challenge. So we got these amazing chefs and they're like, you know, um, I, I, here's another thing. I have a whiskey blog, right? I love whiskey. And my friend Leslie who's a, a plant-based chef is like, you know, you can do a whiskey sour with chickpea water, aquafaba. And I'm like, gross. No, thank you. Like, give me egg whites. And she's like, just try it. And of course I did. I'm like, now in this means I can make vegan whiskey sours or really pisco sours, pick a sour. Um, and it tastes amazing. It doesn't taste like chickpea at all. And you're like, oh, I, I learned something. Now for the rest of my life, I will always have this recipe in my brain. It's super easy to do. Um, yeah. And that's just one of a dozen, you know, just little hints and tricks to, um, be more flexible, you know, depending on who my audience is when I'm cooking. So again, if I have someone that can't have dairy, I know how to make a ton of things thanks to, again, really little substitution tricks. And again, once you learn them, it's like a cheat code in life. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And it's like, it's like chickpeas. You can do a lot of things with chickpeas. You never realize as long as you're not allergic to them. Right. And uh, <laughs> that's the other you thing. Even make hummus, you don't have to have Sesame oil and hummus, you can make it with other ways and mm -hmm. have it be fantastic. Yep. I mean, you can make pesto with pumpkin seeds, you know, and who figured that pesto, because 
of pine nuts was such a triggering food for so many people, yeah. but it really is. And to be like, here's, it was actually the first recipe I put up was a, a pesto with a pumpkin seed from Ali Khan. And it's, it's delicious. It's not exactly the same, but I wouldn't kick it out of bed. I don't know why I'm eating pesto in bed, but whatever. I'm not going to kick it out of bed. <laughs> hey, but no judgments. Exactly. I know. I like, I like pesto. How the heck do you guys make any revenue doing this? I mean, obviously you have to, you know, you weren't cheap. You can make a lot of money doing a lot of things in Hollywood. How in the heck do they afford you? How does this work? That is a fantastic question. Um, our <laughs> our fundraising apparatus is mostly through private donors, um, some grants, um, and some corporate partnerships. Um, but, you know, as a, as a nonprofit, as an NGO, it's, you know, X percentage of every dollar goes to research. I don't know the exact number. It's certainly more than goes into my pocket. Uh, I, I can't tell you, I've, I've seen our annual budget and what I do is the smallest fraction, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so they're doing something right. Yeah. And, and unfortunately galas are really hard to do in fundraising dinners and stuff, but I imagine there's some of that that happens with this. Can you talk, do you have any knowledge at all about the progress that's being made on a given food allergy or in general? Is, is oh, that something sure. you're aware of? I mean, uh, not in any super specifics because I'm not a scientist, but um, you know, we've got uh, 50 clinical network partners and that are doing research all around the country, Stanford, Northwestern, and other places. Um, yeah, there's been amazing developments in the world of peanut allergy with therapeutics, um, something called OIT, which is oral immunotherapy. Uh -huh. um, we're working right now with um, Broad over at MIT on the gut-brain access. So there's all microbiome research, which again, if they can crack that nut, I never shouldn't say crack nuts. People will get mad at me for that. Uh, but if we can um, work through that, that can be you know a true game changer. Again, with like pills that can mitigate allergies. Yeah. Um, the other piece of research that we're spending a lot of time and money on is early introduction. And, and Pete, I don't know if you've got kids or not, but I can tell you again, I've got two. Um, my 12 year old and 20 year old, when they were both born, we were told avoid, 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 avoid all of these allergens. You know, basically it's breast milk or formula, bananas, whatever, little things until, you know, avoid strawberries and peanuts like they're the devil. Right. And we've done studies, we've been partnered with studies, Leap, Seed, others, and it bears out that if, you know, it actually, it's it's so obvious, right? If you give babies as their immunity is growing a variety of foods, their bodies don't see them as alien invaders, right? So it accepts them. So we've been able to, through some of these studies, prove out um, the efficacy of early introduction. So we're doing a lot. I mean, weirdly enough, if we're successful at early introduction, we'll put ourselves out of business, which I think is probably a good thing for the world. Um, yeah. But um, so we're doing a lot of research in that regard with babies. Yeah. Interesting. What have you picked up along the way? Like, you know, you go into this, okay, I know how to make a TV show. I can make you blah, blah, blah. That's easy. But what have you like, huh? I had no idea. And that's a lot more challenging or that's a lot more interesting than I'd ever realized. I mean, if I'm being completely candid, Pete, uh, the yeah. challenge is we've had an amazing audience on like my holiday programming. We've had a great audience on a handful of uh, webinars here and there, a lot of stuff with the babies, my stand and start cooking shows they've not broken through an audience. And I'm shocked considering I've got talent with crazy audiences and getting people at home to convert to watch videos is more difficult than I expected. So that is definitely eye-opening um, considering how good the content is, which, right. you know, I guess the lesson learned is keep at it and keep doing better, right? It's like putting out a podcast, just keep <laughs> sharing them out. The audience yep. will be there as long as the quality is great. Our quality is fantastic. Um, I've also learned that if you talk to people, food allergy has impacted everyone at yeah. some level. Everyone knows someone. Um, and almost everyone across the board is excited to learn how they can help, which again, mm -hmm. interesting, maybe not surprising if you saw how successful like the ALS ice bucket challenge was. And statistically, ALS impacts far fewer people than food allergies, but they were able to raise $250 million with that ice bucket challenge because yeah. when people care, they activate. So yeah. maybe not surprising, but it's been a nice eye-opening moment to see how responsive um, our audience has been. 
there's another accelerator in that too. Like, yes, the ice bucket challenge. You don't realize that, you know, the, actually the dude that started that, his ALS fund, he had, he just died just like a week ago. But um, it also gets you audience in Congress, you know, and mm -hmm. it's notable. Like there's someone from the ALS world. She passed. She was actually in Hollywood. She worked with Renee Zellweger and a bunch of other people. You know, she was, um, I think she was an agent and she picked up ALS and she passed on. But all of a sudden now you get really heavyweights that are passionate because this person not only helps manage their career, but has become dear to them. I mean, very close. And that also gets you access to more things. And with the prevalence of food allergies, it would just seem like at some point, yeah, there's going to be a tripping moment where everybody, I mean, I, I cooked uh, last week. I made goulash. Didn't come out great. It, it would taste good, but it wasn't very goulashy to me. But I, I used my laptop in the kitchen on YouTube, you know, mm -hmm. as I did it. I had a website and a, and a video, and I did that. And I know that that'll happen more often. But I, I wonder what it is about going to food. Maybe Food Network is just such a magnet that it's it's hard to it's hard yeah. to get people off of that. I don't know. I think that's that's definitely part of it. Um, and I also think we're we're reeducating our audience on what we're providing. You know, uh, up until recently, we provided mostly educational resources. It was not a lot of lifestyle stuff. So right. as we grow, and, and I am very proud to say that our metrics are, I don't get on pat myself on the back, um, like our, our engagement rate on Instagram is up 600% in three oh, wow. months. Like, yeah. it's, they're finding us because we keep delivering it. And it's it's a little bit that feel the dreams. If we build it, they will come. And they are. You know, yeah. every video does better than the one before. But I'm used to millions and millions and millions of people watching my shows. <laughs> and now I'm like excited when I get 50,000 views. Um, yeah, which is yeah, fifty thousand people, by the way, paying attention to you in any kind of social media is is great. You know, uh, it drives me bonkers. If, like when I watch videos that people make, and I love that they're creating and they've got an audience. I'm not saying anything about about that, but like when it's like this teenager's response to watching Tom Sawyer from Rush, and you're like a million hits, like they just discovered a forty year old song. You know, and they <laughs> they hold their face together like that. That's what people want, or or you see, uh, and this kills me, and this kills me because I've got a degree in, in TV radio, right? So I, I I used to get yelled at to get my editing improved. That's how they taught people my they yelled at you. But I watch these edits, these video edits with jump cuts and breaking all the rules. I saw a 180 rule break, and I'm like, what are you got? How in the world is this accepted? It drives me bananas, Jonathan. A, I'm completely with you, but I give all the YouTubers a big old get out of jail free card. When I watch proper network television or Netflix or Amazon and I see the 180 getting violated, jump cuts, bad edits, uh, yeah. bad sound design. Oh. Uh, it's like the most watched limited series in Netflix history, apparently, per the news today, was The Queen's Gambit, uh, yeah. which is lovely. Um, they break so many rules of sound design in that show that I want to, and I have audibly been like, no, no, that's not how a piano sounds in that room. Um, which makes watching television with my wife very annoying for her. But oh, yes. Yeah. You know what? I had one of those and I love the crown. I've, I've been watching it. I watch it like a mechanic, but I also watch it like an audience member and um, Diana and Charles get off an airplane and they come down and there's, you know, 50 people around there, a crowd, but you know, the sound that they put in was like, and I'm like, there's 50 people there. <laughs> like, yeah. They didn't make that big of a sound. And I was like, how in the world did that get by? How, how, how does that get by somebody? It's one of my favorite questions, knowing how difficult it is to get anything done. You're like, right. all right, from the PA up to, you know, internal, uh, again, the crown, for example, must have four or five production companies underneath it. Like people saw it and were like, yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Um, a show that I had sold a pilot of but didn't end up on a series was, um, it doesn't matter what it was called. Uh, it was a look at the music videos at the MTV Music Video Library because we would collect 20 new ones a week. We'd only air like four though. So there were 16 that had been shot, approved, approved through MTV as well to get into the library. And they are were the most ghastly, like, what is this? Yeah. And there were hundreds of them. Again, this is all pre-YouTube, but... Um, yeah, it's shocking to me. Like, how does this get, how did this get made? Yeah. It's and how can I not make my movie? If you can make that POS, how can I not make my movie? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want half of the money 
and I can make something that's at least that bad, if not probably better. You know, <laughs> like it's, I um, again, I, I get to watch a lot of indie films and I'm not being overly critical of them, but there is a difference of like that big budget, that continuity thing, like shot for shot. Like the, let's say there's, I don't know, a hundred shots that are taken in this movie and the quality of each shot can be dramatically different in an indie movie. You know, they don't have a budget to get all of the like, like the lighting to be exactly right, you know, and, and move in a way that makes sense. So, uh, anyhow, well, that's, you know, I, when I guess when you get behind the curtain, you just get to see a lot more things and it makes it harder to enjoy a movie or someone's success on YouTube. I'm not as, I, I'm happy they're doing it and I love it. They've got a career doing it and hopefully they'll have me on their show to help out. But it is exasperating when you well, try to see the, uh, I completely agree with equally exasperating on the flip side is, uh, again, I, I teach uh, at a high school a filmmaking magnet here, and every one of my students has an iPhone or a Galaxy. So they have a 4K recording device in their hand. Yeah. But they're like, well, I need to you know, do X, Y, and Z to like, start making my thing. It's like, what are you waiting on? Yeah. Like, you've got an audience of zero already. The worst thing that happens is you do something and it's not good and no one watches it. So you're starting at the ground, like, go make. And yeah. maybe it's because I am Gen X and I grew up with a, a literal v, 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 um, VHS strappy yeah. camera system, um, editing VHS to VHS before I got into film school, physically cutting film. Like making TV and movies was really hard when I was coming up. And it's so easy for people today. Like, like just go do it. Yeah. Just do it. Like the, um, the Chiron machine and what we were stuck with. You know, mm -hmm. no, no, I, I programmed some purple. You didn't program anything. You just pushed a button. It was already in there. And you only get purple. You only get blue. You're like, <laughs> it's like no. so. I've done so many Grass Valley edits where I had to have every piece of B-roll picked and time-coded and well in advance and giant bins uh -huh. of tapes. And actually, my garage still has four bins of tapes for my career. And yeah. I don't think I'll see, I'll see a three-quarter machine again in my life. Okay. Uh, it's yeah. there. I I, uh, I did all my stuff, you know, on uh, dependent whatever kind of tape I could get, whatever kind of camera I could get, you know, a lot of VHS, but some other kinds of tape, like three quarter, all that kind of thing. But um, yeah, you're right. You, you you pour your heart and soul into this, and then you go into the edit bay, and you must you must be able to feel this pain. You go to edit, you set your edit points, and because it's a mechanical mechanical machine, it slides, and you're like, no, 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 and so you set it with the slide accounted for. And it doesn't slide. And you're like, oh, sweet Jesus. <laughs> this is kill me. I mean, I'll tell you some nightmare. I remember interviewing Whitney Houston on a red carpet, Vanity Fair Oscar party many years back. And she rolled up. She was an unexpected guest. And we hit record and started the interview. But you need like six seconds of pre-roll so that it can get to speed for your edit. So we yes. missed the beginning of the bite, um, which was like the why are you here? I can't, it doesn't matter what it was. But like, oh, yeah. The things that kids today don't need to worry about. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's great. It, but, it, but it does open up the ability to create a lot of things and, and have people on. Are there any kind of strategic thoughts on, you know, having, I, I guess I would say something like, you know, having a main character have a significant food allergy, you know, and have that not be part of the story, but not, not part of the story. Like, oh, shit, this burrito has beans in it, you know. I'm going to be down the next eight hours. Is that something that you think you see in the future? Is that something you guys are interested in trying to implement? I mean, I hope so. I mean, the last time a main character had an allergy was we're talking about Peter Rabbit, the, the Sony movie, which caused a fervor because there was a food fight scene. And the whole idea was let's, you know, use fuel allergies as a weapon. So I would love to see a main character with an allergy where it's not seen as um, a, a, stig a stigma, a weapon, a, yeah. or a punchline, um, right. where it's just something else to do. Now, the problem is, of course, if you are a good main character, good charismatic protagonist, and you just need to not have, you know, peanuts or whatever, does it become like a James Bond thing where you're like shaking us or that's my thing. It's a one line in a movie and then I move on with it. Like, you know, I can't eat that because yeah. you can't, I mean, if they're doing it right and they're a hero, you're not going to hear about it too often. But uh, I am working on an animated short uh, with some buddies of mine from Nickelodeon that worked on Little Bill with me way back in the day. Uh, we got pitched a short film from a student at University of Miami who grew up with severe food allergies and, you know, sat at that no nut table in school. And she herself was a little black girl. She's now a, a young black woman feeling completely alone and different. You're like, all right, I love this sort of, again, it's just a short one-off, but it's yeah. a story of acceptance told personally. So, um, yeah, that's my goal to do more, you know, protagonist stories. And again, to just take the stigma away. 
again, I, you know, see, I went down the wrong road and I was thinking about um, a couple of things, but specifically in Parasite, I don't know if you saw Parasite the movie, but they shave peach fuzz and they, they blow it onto the person who's got the peach allergy and, yep. you know, use it as a way to, to undermine their, their livelihood and everything. I mean, the boy season two, I mean, ma ma major spoiler alert. So if you haven't watched the boy season two, turn off this podcast. Um, <laughs> You know, they use Almond Joy as a weapon because one of the, you know, superheroes has a, an almond allergy. Yeah. And, you know, it ends with him in an ICU. Spoiler alert again. Um, yeah. Other spoiler, season two wasn't very good. Deal with it. <laughs> um, but again, now you're talking about the sort of the dark side of food allergy, which you know, I would love to find a, you know, characters about to eat something and then a friend is like, no, because like it's a good moment, not a negative moment. But yeah, we'll get there. One, one I thing thought of another uh, editing thing or storyline thing that really bugs me, and it made me basically. I don't like J.J. Abrams films because of it. I hold it against them to this day. <laughs> so, I know his films are good. I'm trying to get over it, but it was so egregious. I was like, that's it, done, never watching anything he does. And so it was in the, it was in Alias towards the end. I don't know if you saw Alias, but there was this um, giant water balloon type thing, huge, enormous water balloon. It's like in this hangar, mm -hmm. and uh, it breaks. And so the water just comes flooding out, and then um, the Alias chick, right, she's running down, and she gets down the hallway ahead of her boyfriend, and she has to have to do the moment at the window, and the water comes flooding in, and it drowns him. This balloon was smaller than the room it was in. How on earth did it flood all these? Like they could have had him electrocuted or something, but sure. they chose to have him drown because there was so much water. And I'm like, there's just not enough water to do that. Yeah, there would have been a mess throughout the warehouse and the factory or whatever, but there was never going to drown anybody unless they passed out in a, you know, it was just. Pete, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that a TV show from I don't know, 15 years ago, it yeah. still bothers you to this day. It does. It does. bugs me. All right. So enough about that. Let's just let's plug everything and wrap this thing up. to everybody where they can go to get all the stuff about living to you. Sure. So there's two main websites to go to. Uh, the main one is www.foodallergy.org, which is your one-stop hub for all things food allergies. We've got resources there, uh, emergency action plans, um, community reach out, all that sort of stuff. The other place to go if you just want the sort of lifestyle content is www.livingtealchannel.com, um, which is actually just a friendly URL that drives you right back to foodology.org. Um, but it's where, where all of our uh, shows are. In fact, we dropped a new episode today of Teal Holidays with Heather, which is the right. best episode yet. I recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Um, Christmas tips done with a little John Oliver style. Yeah, no, I, I love it. Yeah, and I watched it. And I mean, I was going to tell you, you did a good job, but you know that. I mean, it was it was a quality thing, and and you would never. It's, it's dumb to even say this. You would never know you weren't watching like a network thing because you guys do network great things. It's just now you get to watch it in this very specific things. Uh, if nobody else tells you and the crew today, thanks for what you're doing because it's going to save a life. It's going to make living those lives easier. And, you know, it's such a minor thing that we can all account for. And, and it's fun to cook in a new way. It's fun to cook a, you know, a recipe for somebody like, Hey, I made this, I know you have this allergy and no one's even going to care except for I made it for you special. And just to have that as a gift that you can give to someone else. I think that's marvelous, man. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for taking all that time to, to, to make this cause matter because it does. Thank you. I, I, a, I appreciate that. And B, I think it's a beautiful idea for the holiday. Specifically, if you know someone that can't eat X, Y, or Z, make them something special because nothing will make you feel more whole than than that feeling giving someone a delicious piece of nutritious whatever, uh, yeah. cake or something savory. So I'm all, that's a great idea. We might we might take that, Pete, and put that on social media. As I love idea. it. Yeah, do it. It's a great gift to give somebody. All right. So www.foodallergy.org. Everybody look in the show notes. I have all that stuff in here. Uh, uh, Jonathan Kane, thank you so much for coming on. Stand by. I'm going to sign off.